Hello, and thank you for attending my virtual presentation. My name is Erin Baxter, and I currently work at the University of Idaho as the Executive Director of International Programs. A variety of experiences throughout my career in international higher education have raised challenging ethical questions that I will reflect on in this presentation, particularly my work facilitating student mobility and collaboration between institutions in the global north and global south as director of a scholarship program for students from the African continent at my previous institution. My plan is to introduce three distinct approaches to thinking about global ethics that I have found helpful for expanding the questions I ask and interpreting the perspectives I encounter. I will reflect on how these frameworks apply to the day-to-day -day work of internationalization and identify some promising practices to spark ongoing reflection and action. I hope to demonstrate how engaging with diverse ethical frameworks allows us to identify limitations and reimagine our efforts to achieve personal and societal change through international education. International engagement has a long history in higher education and is nothing new. However, it is within the past two decades that consensus has emerged that internationalization is not really an option, but an imperative for higher education institutions. The notion that internationalization is both necessary and desirable and should be a strategic focus area. Buckner and Stein employ critical discourse analysis to examine how internationalization is defined by the three leading international education organizations listed here. Through an analysis of key publications from each organization, they consider which activities, topics, and constituencies are included in conceptualizations of internationalization and which are absent. The documents examined are not comprehensive of each organization's work. However, the sources selected do represent prominent ideas about best practices and tools used to collect global data on higher education responses to the internationalization imperative. So they insightfully highlight activities that are associated and valued within internationalization. Through this analysis, the authors found that all three organizations rely on largely similar definitions, including those listed here. <clears throat> Omissions were also similar across the documents analyzed. For example, the first four activities listed here were not among the metrics considered to gauge internationalization commitments. The authors also found that all documents gave limited attention to the historical and geopolitical inequalities that characterize global higher education and the ethical issues that arise when engaging across unequal power relations. They point out that all documents reflected an emphasis on defining difference primarily by visa status and perpetuating a dichotomy between international and domestic students by giving little attention to other forms of diversity, such as race, class, or gender, and commonalities such as linguistic and cultural diversity that exist among both populations. Overall, the discourse analysis reveals how influential voices normalize certain ideas while minimizing others. The authors conclude that these omissions <clears throat> of anything having to do with the historical or geopolitical make it, quote, likely that existing inequalities in international engagements will simply be reproduced in the imperative to internationalize, unquote. As this and other studies make clear, the discourse of internationalization is broad enough to encompass a wide range of priorities and activities, including both bottom line concerns and high-minded ideals. They are driven by a desire to generate income, compensate for declining public funding and maintain competitiveness, while also cultivating intercultural competence, global citizenship, and societal benefits. In addition to the declining support, conceptual ambiguity, and concerns with reproducing global inequities, recent discussions highlight concerns that current trends such as global rankings and efforts to expand mobility perpetuate the dominance of particular ways of knowing that are foundational to the Western higher education model. There is also a growing strand of research that examines the environmental impacts of student mobility and seeks to address sustainability concerns in international higher education more broadly. 
While I don't have time to elaborate extensively on these concerns, it's worth noting that they are also gaining increasing attention. These concerns highlight the importance of thinking beyond how we might expand international education and attending to the quality and outcomes of our internationalization efforts. In other words, we need to carefully consider how we are equipping our students for a global world and take precautions to cultivate responsible global citizens. It is our responsibility to ask how and to what ends we are equipping our students. So this leads into a discussion of ethics, which pervade all decisions we make in regard to international education. These are a few examples of recent publications that engage with various frameworks for thinking about ethics in the realm of internationalization, written predominantly by Canadian scholars. Drawing largely from the piece in the bottom left corner, corner, I will introduce three frameworks, the liberal, critical, and decolonial, that I have found quite helpful for deepening and diversifying my own thinking around global ethics. I want to emphasize that these are just three of many ways to think about global ethics. My intent is not to devalue any particular approach, but along with these authors, to appreciate the insights and limitations of each. Each of these frameworks, quote, operates according to different orienting assumptions, horizons of hope, and theories of change, unquote. <clears throat> Liberalism is the most predominant of these three frameworks. It encompasses a range of perspectives. <coughs> these are characterized by, quote, the presumed political authority of nation states, economic inevitability of capitalist markets, epistemic authority of Western knowledge, and anthropocentric separation of humans from the earth, unquote. Each of these global ethics approach, approaches offers a distinct response to the question, how might we address unevenly shared problems and sustain coexistence on a finite planet? From a liberal perspective, the answer lies more in more social order within the framework of nation states, more economic access to social mobility within the bounds of capitalism, and more shared knowledge within the bounds of Western epistemic traditions. When ethical questions such as brain drain arise as international students move from low income to high income economies, the liberal approach asks questions such as how can we ensure that both host and home countries benefit from their experiences. In regard to international study, how might we cultivate engaged global citizens? And in regard to curriculum, what do we need to include to ensure students develop cultural competency? <clears throat> Questioning the universality of liberalism's proposed solutions, critical, critical approaches are united by their focus on an enduring set of power relations that exist internationally. They draw attention to the ways in which liberal responses to ethical dilemmas often reproduce unequal power relationships and offer simplistic solutions to geopolitical, economic, epistemological, and ecological concerns. In response to the question, how might we address unevenly shared problems and sustain human coexistence on a finite planet, critical perspectives emphasize the need to redistribute resources, democratize governance, and pluralize knowledge traditions within mainstream institutions. This framework raises questions such as, how can we overcome structural barriers that limit mobility for students, certain student populations? How might we equip students going abroad, particularly to global South contexts, to acknowledge and challenge assumed supremacy? How can we build capacity for teaching and research beyond Western knowledge traditions? Of the three approaches introduced here, the decolonial is the most underdeveloped <clears throat> in ethics, scholarship, and practice. This perspective seeks to denaturalize the, quote, enduring coloniality of the liberal global imaginary, unquote, as well as its underpinning institutions and social relationships. It recognizes that the power dynamics that emerged as a result of colonialism extend far beyond colonial administrations and have particularly significant implications for global knowledge production. In response to how might we address unevenly shared problems and sustain human coexistence on a finite planet, 
Decolonial perspectives emphasize that we must imagine possibilities beyond those proposed by liberal and critical perspectives. Rather than ask how to ensure benefits of international student mobility to sending countries and remove structural barriers to access, this approach asks whether expanding access to Western institutions is indeed the answer. It recognizes the contradictions that exist within any community and the human tendency to romanticize difference, asking how we might prepare students to respect and revere differences without romanticizing or idealizing them. In regard to curriculum, it asks if and how we might truly embrace epistemic pluralism. A decolonial approach to ethics is therefore articulated and practiced from the edge of the dominant liberal ethical frames, looking outward toward other possibilities, but committed to learning from the, stakes, the mistakes of the other frames. <clears throat> To connect this rather theoretical discussion with the day-to-day -day work of engaging in international education, I'd like to introduce you to Kofi, a pseudonym for one of the students I worked with in my previous role directing the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program at Arizona State University. Throughout my work with this program, I engaged with many challenging discussions regarding the ethics of bringing students from the African continent who would otherwise have limited access to higher education to pursue degrees at institutions in other contexts, in my case, the US. Kofi is an impressive individual who comes from a community in Ghana, and I believe is currently back in Ghana, although seeking to pursue further study abroad. I worked with him for four years as he pursued an undergraduate degree in engineering. Partway through his studies in the US, he decided to launch a small scale social enterprise in Ghana and was awarded a resolution fellowship that included funding to develop a small palm oil producing business to expand access to employment and a staple cooking ingredient in low income communities. <clears throat> the narrative on the resolution fellowship website states that Kofi is committed to traveling back home to serve his nation of Ghana, believes in equal opportunities for all, is a member of Global Resolve Club, a student organization that carries out humanitarian services in developing countries, and dreams of being an auto automotive engineer as well as a social entrepreneur to change lives and promote sustainable growth. This narrative highlights a focus on giving back and helping develop developing countries, indicative of an underlying concern that Kofi's mobility may otherwise be a loss to his home nation. It also highlights equal opportunities and sustainable development, implying a particular vision for social change, and that Western education, particularly engineering education, is part of the answer to social challenges. From a critical or decolonial perspective, one might ask, how did Kofi gain access to studying in the United States? What allowed him to overcome certain barriers while others in his community did not? How has Kofi's experience in the US shaped, how has his experience shaped his view of the Ghanaian context and his capacity to work toward change? How might this be different had he studied at a Ghanaian institution? What kind of impact does palm oil production have on the environment in Ghana? Interestingly, the concerns around the environmental destruction of palm oil production seem to have little impact on the funding of his project. What opportunities and challenges has Kofi faced as he returned to his community in Ghana and what barriers limit his ability to continue with further study? Kofi's story is just one example of the challenging questions that are raised when we apply these different global ethics lenses to the practice of international education. While I don't have time to elaborate on examples related to students participating in international study and service, North-South University partnerships or curriculum internationalization efforts, they would similarly inspire nuanced ethical discussions. I hope that I have demonstrated that these frameworks are a helpful tool for identifying and reflecting on ethical considerations and encourage you to try these out, try these lenses out as you reflect on your experiences or plans to bring students abroad, internationalize your curriculum, or engage in international partnerships and collaborations. 
For me, this exercise highlights how a tendency to think about ethical questions from within bounds of the modern global colonial imaginary, which in many ways limits our ability to imagine beyond our current structures. While the liberal and critical frameworks raise important questions, it is the decolonial frame that really expands my horizon for imagining new transformative possibilities. Decolonial perspectives highlight the limitations of assuming unlimited growth, linear development, and the superiority of Western ways of knowing. They invite imagining other possibilities for how we might address unevenly shared problems and sustain human coexistence on a finite planet.